Finnovate showcases cutting-edge banking and financial technology through a global conference series featuring short-form demos and thought leadership. Now, the conversation continues on the Finnovate podcast. Hello and welcome to the Finnovate podcast. Joining me today, we have Anurag Lal, CEO of NetSphere. Anurag, thank you so much for joining me today. Good to be here, Greg. So let's start by giving people a little bit of background on yourself. You're with NetSphere now, but you used to work for the Obama administration. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences and what led you here? Absolutely. I've had the distinct uh, privilege and uh, pleasure to be involved with technology, telecommunications, software for the last uh, 30 plus years. I know that dates me a little bit, but uh, it, uh, it has allowed me to live through um, technology as it's grown pre-internet, during the internet, and hopefully now as we go into an internet 2.0. I've um, been involved in a bunch of uh, telecom entities uh, that are names that you all know today, along with a couple of uh, startups that uh, had uh, the privilege to take public and uh, and provide value to shareholders. So uh, it's, it's it's been a great ride. And like you said, along the way, I had uh, the distinct pleasure and the privilege to be part of the Obama administration as well uh, as part of the National Broadband Task Force, Greg. Wow. So you've seen some stuff, I think is sort of a short way to summarize that. I'm particularly interested in your experience uh, working for the FCC as part of that U.S. National Broadband Task Force. Can you talk a little bit about what that role entailed and what you were doing there? Absolutely. And, and it was an ex, you know. A huge honor to be invited to be part of the National Broadband Task Force. It was the first such uh, task force that was set up on the behest of uh, President Obama. Uh, It was a promise he made during his uh, 2008 uh, election campaign because he believed that uh, broadband as a technology was an integral part of uh, the economy and our ability to be competitive on a global stage. He also believed broadband was a game changer and should be made available to all aspects of society. And uh, at that point in time, um, OECD had kind of listed us uh, pretty down uh, in in the ranks with regards to broadband availability. And so he wanted to make sure that uh, a plan was put together that provided a roadmap towards the investment of uh, broadband technologies, capabilities, and availability to make our country and our people competitive. Certainly. And I think we're going to talk about some of the security aspects of that in a minute. But before we get there, I'm just curious if there are any pieces you can point to that people can see in in the kind of day-to-day lives that are a result of some of the work that you guys did. Absolutely. You know, we looked at all aspects of of broadband. We looked at, uh, you know, broadband from a technology perspective. We looked at wireline. We looked at wireless. We looked at satellite. uh, We looked at spectrum and spectrum uh, utilization. uh, We looked at uh, broadband availability. We looked at, uh, you know, broadband affordability. And so, you know, the good news is a lot of times these plans, uh, uh, you know, are built and the effects take time. Uh, to become a parent. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were delighted to see some of the effects that took place sooner rather than the later. But uh, we did create ripples, and those ripples, you know, took time to, you know, crash towards the shore and, and create real change. But I can point to distinct examples where a um, couple of programs that are today available where broadband availability is uh, uh, pretty much standard in high schools and school institutions. Uh, that was something that we we addressed. We also made broadband available at local libraries free of charge. We also made broadband available along with devices to, to certain uh, rungs of society. Uh, and also, I can point towards the U.S.'s leadership in 5G availability. At the point in time, uh, the broadband task force was thought about. Uh, U.S. was trailing with regards to 3G availability, and Europe was the leader. And uh, there was a thought process that, you know, we need to turn that around. And, you know, I won't sit here and take entire credit for today, the U.S. leading with regards to 5G network availability. Uh, But I do believe that we played a very important role in creating that ripple that ultimately led to our positioning in the global 5G market, which is uh, uh, extremely important. 
Absolutely. I mean, access to broadband services is key. And I think increasingly so, you know, if you look at what happened over the last couple of years, especially when you think about how much more challenging it would have been to keep our society going without access to basic connectivity. Um, obviously, a lot that goes on there it is kind of behind the scenes, but it had a real impact. Of course, one of the sides that it had an impact on was the ability now for you know, bad actors to have new avenues to come in and, and create problems for us, not just as consumers, but as financial institutions and as innovators. I think right now we're kind of all looking at um, you know, what's happening in Russia and looking at, you know, sort of expecting this other shoe to drop. Of course, it's certainly not just Russian operatives who are engaged in cyber attacks against banks, but that's sort of where our, our minds are all leading us at the moment. What do you see as being kind of the biggest threat right now that people in fintech need to be aware of? And, and I guess my follow-up question is, has that principal threat changed much over the past few months with the Russian invasion? Um, I, I don't believe so at all. It means uh, I believe cyber as a threat uh, vector is going to continue to increase. Uh, and that's, it's increasing for multiple reasons. First and foremost, with the advent of the internet and the digitization of, the, of, of applications across the globe, uh, we've created a very prey-rich environment that, um, you know, um, anyone who wants to kind of commit a bad act could potentially leverage if the right safeguards are not applied. Uh, and we see, we saw the advent of uh, of cyber intrusions and cyber uh, threats uh, take place initially by non-government actors. This was organized crime who found that they could leverage. Uh, cyber as a means to compromise people, accounts, entities, and gain benefit as a result. But along the way, government actors got into the mix as well. And today, uh, cyber uh, as a, a thought process has been weaponized by state actors. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we hear about uh, countries like North Korea, China, and now Russia, as you rightly mentioned, uh, are leveraging this because they believe that with very little effort, uh, they can actually create a fairly large effect by, by leveraging cyber as a means to compromise infrastructure, um, banking institutions, healthcare institutions, and the like. Uh, and so, like you said, it's rightfully so. Financial companies have to be extra aware because they are directly responsible for transactional um, capabilities that could potentially cause harm if they're not correctly managed, correctly processed, or correctly pr protected. So I believe that threat vector continues to increase, and not just because of the Russia-Ukraine war, because it's just going to exponentially increase because digitization is going to continue to grow exponentially. Uh, and uh, with the advent of Web 2.0, that uh, prey-rich environment is going to become that much more prey-rich. And as a result, we will see more such instances. No, I think describing it as a, a prey-rich environment is is really just it's a good turn of phrase because that's absolutely what's happening. We're seeing more people coming into uh, getting more comfortable with uh, financial systems online, doing more of their business online, sharing more of their lives online, and and that looks like it's certainly going to continue and, and potentially continue exponentially. So this prey-rich environment, I think, is obviously a massive problem and. Um, on the one hand, it's great. People are adopting new fintech solutions as an industry. We love to see that. We love to see people kind of taking advantage of the tools that the industry is working on. At the same time, there is this massive exposure to risk that comes from that. So where does the responsibility for defending against that risk lie? Because you've got a couple of interested parties. Certainly the government is interested. Financial institutions obviously have a huge stake and individual consumers do as well. Who among those groups is principally responsible for protecting us? And, and, um, and, and Greg, that, that's a great question. But unfortunately, there is no single silver bullet that solves this problem. So there is no single entity that steps up and says, I take responsibility and I'm going to make sure everybody's safe. That's just not the way it works. So the responsibility has to be managed at all aspects along those entities that you mentioned. The government obviously has to step up because they have to make sure that the uh, baseline infrastructure like power, oil, water, et cetera, is, uh, is maintained and not compromised. They also have to make sure that consumer interests are well maintained and managed and protected. 
Uh, so they have a huge responsibility. And for that matter, they have to make sure that they have the right entities in place, empowered with the right regulation and laws, uh, funded well, uh, and at the same point of time with the right processes in place to ensure that they not only uh, manage issues, but ensure that we protect against issues. Uh, now that same responsibility continues on towards financial institutions and other organizations uh, who are running applications that are being leveraged either by consumers or by other entities. It's their responsibility to ensure that they're building adequate security, adequate encryption, into their applications so as to ensure that those are not compromised um, or, or are much more difficult to be compromised. Uh, and, and, and this is true for all kinds of entities within that realm, whether that be technology companies, healthcare entities, financial institutions. And then the third most important layer is the individual. The individual comes in two forms, as a consumer and as an employee. And today we've seen the weakest link sometimes ends up being the individual, even though they, they, they mean well, they ultimately end up compromising uh, and being the weakest link in this entire equation. So they have to be well-informed. They have to be well-educated. They also have to be smart in the way they operate some of these new convenient features that are being made available, uh, like online banking, online transactions, uh, uh, leveraging you know, real currency, cryptocurrency, what have you. So, so they have to be, be mindful, aware, and engaged in the process. While we build the tools, when I, when I say we, we build the tools uh, to ensure uh, that uh, they can leverage those tools as a means to continue to be secure and do so securely. So the responsibility is across the board, but I think there is, if one silver bullet, I refer to that as encryption, because I believe if encryption, well-intentioned encryption is deployed appropriately and well-deployed, it provides protections that today can keep uh, all aspects of what we do safe. Well, I think looking at those three groups, looking at kind of government, banks, and individuals, and looking at who among that group is most likely to be in a position to really make significant headway here, I think we should always kind of temper our expectations for what's possible from a governmental standpoint. I think if we look at it, you know, history tells us that individual consumers are um, maybe spotty at best at kind of safeguarding their, their own identities online. And that kind of leaves banks as this group who is potentially the ones with the most power here, certainly the resources to do something about it, a lot at risk that would kind of motivate some action here. So you know, looking at these, and I certainly don't disagree, individual consumers need much more help than they're getting and to be able to make those kinds of decisions to keep themselves safe. But it is kind of banks who are in this position as of right now to do a lot here. You mentioned encryption as being a, a way to kind of fight against this. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that and, and maybe any other pieces of advice you have for bankers in particular who are looking at this and thinking we need to do something? No, and I think you correctly point out that the financial institutions have a huge responsibility. Again, I won't uh, uh, let the government off the hook either because the government has the most to lose as well in this uh, environment. But come, talking more in the context of financial institutions, today financial institutions have, uh, have to take a multi-pronged approach towards security for all aspects of what they do. Uh, and they have to look at all their applications and make sure that they are appropriately secure uh, and uh, and also make sure that they are appropriately encrypted. And I talk about encryption because I believe encryption, if deployed well in the right context, can be a very powerful weapon in protect protecting against intrusions that could compromise these financial institutions. So application layer encryption is extremely important. The second piece is transactional in encryption. And the example there is the SWIFT banking system. One of the reasons they've been successful is because they use transactional encryption and, uh, and they continue to update that to keep those transactions secure. So it's extremely important to make sure that financial institutions are deploying a transactional um, uh, encryption, not only in transactions that are bank to bank or institution to institution, but also in the transactions that uh, are processed between uh, financial institution and consumer. Uh, and that's where co communication comes in as well, because it's extremely important to ensure that when they are communicating, they're communicating robustly in a closed environment that's entirely uh, encrypted as well. You know, my company deploys an application that the 
refer to as NetSphere that does exactly that. So I'm very uh, well aware of the advantages a platform such as that can provide a banking institution. So that's something that is real and should be deployed. And then, then finally, I think the consumer. We have to make sure that we, while we educate them and make them intelligent, we give them foolproof tools and applications that are updated constantly with the right amount of encryption, security, two-factor authentication, again, a very simple mechanism for ensuring a level of security and assuring that the, the transaction is originating uh, at, the right, uh, at the right area. So these are just a couple of examples of how institutions can protect all aspects of what they do to create um, a, you know, an environment that's closed and uh, kind of protected from cyber attacks. Yeah, certainly there is a lot to do there. And I think it's important to highlight the fact that there is help, right? So any financial institution executive is listening to this and thinking that all sounds really difficult to do. This is a large part of what the fintech industry is doing now. Companies like yours, like Netsphere, are there to help. There are certainly no shortage of other sides of uh, the security equation that people in fintech are looking at. So um, for anybody who's interested in learning more, obviously shows like Finnovate can highlight these new innovations, but you don't have to look too far to find the help that you need. We are about out of time here. So I just want to end on kind of your vision of the future. Looking at the future, what sort of threats do you see as becoming the most prominent ones when we look at the next five or 10 years? So, you know, if I take a step back and, and, I, and I look at the speed at which things have progressed and, and innovation has driven uh, the dig digitization of our environment over the last 10 years, and I kind of go out 30 years from here, um, I believe that, uh, you know, the threat vector is going to increase exponentially. Uh, the reason it's going to increase exponentially is because we're going to see the advent of incremental digitization into all aspects of what you do, especially in the context of banking and financial institutions. We're going to see cryptocurrencies take a mainstream role. We'll see digital currencies being launched across the globe and be made available. All these transactions will happen in uh, the Web 2.0 environment that sometimes is referred to as the metaverse, which is sometimes all digital, where the, where the, the transaction is digital, the goods are digital, uh, and the receiver is digital. And, and that creates an exponentially denser, prey-rich environment, if you may, whereby the threat vector increases exponentially. And that's why there will have to be more checks and balances. There will have to be some level of regulation, but more importantly, more innovation to drive a level of security in all aspects of what you do to ensure this next metaverse does not create an environment that is, uh, that, that, that is this scary, if you may, uh, and, and can be managed. And, and so that everybody can leverage the benefits of what the metaverse or cryptocurrencies or NFTs has to deliver. And they have lots of benefits. So I'd rather focus on the benefits and make sure that innovation and in securing these realms uh, keeps up so that we all take advantage of those benefits moving forward. Yeah, certainly there are going to be more, uh, that, that kind of prey-rich environment is going to continue. And I think you can look at security as kind of the price you have to pay. If you want to do something cool, you want to do something that's unique, that's not been done before, offer end users a way to engage with their money in a way they haven't before, that's the price you have to pay. You have to keep them secure. You have to be able to offer that in a way that lets people do those things without exposing themselves to additional risk. That's going to continue to be a real challenge. It certainly shouldn't stand in the way of people doing amazing things. Things that we've been doing. Um, and, and hopefully we can just keep an eye on that side of it as well so that we're able to really get the most out of them. Well, thank you so much. Again, we've been ch chatting with Anurag Lal, uh, CEO of NetSphere. Really appreciate you taking the time. I enjoyed the conversation, Greg. Thank you very much. The Finnovate podcast is produced by Informa Connect in association with Provoke.fm Media. Check out Finnovate.com for information on Finnovate's upcoming shows and to learn how you can get involved. The discount code Finnovate Podcast will save you 20% on tickets to all of our events. And you can email us at info at for information on sponsoring, speaking, or demoing. Thanks for listening.